Hi, I'm Loretta Wagner, and I'm here today to talk to you about shame and social media in a framework of biblical ethics. The shaming of individuals or groups is a widespread practice implemented to form moral concepts reprised in our digital age by means of social media. This ancient practice enables unaccountable masses to disparage others without evidence, investigation, and little or no moral constraints or consequences. The threefold scope of this presentation discusses shame and social media in a framework of biblical ethics. Social media shaming undermines traditional Christian ethical values as evidenced by historical attempts of societies to psychologically impact human behaviors through shame. The dysfunctionality of maintaining ethical selfhood in a realm of shallow social representations, and the inadvertent use of shame by Christians as a legitimate tool to influence personal ethical growth in others without consideration for their distinct personhood. Throughout human existence, the need to live in community has necessitated a framework of accepted social norms that determine the virtuous behavior of its members and bring attention to collective interests. While anthropologists make the case that shame is universal as well as biological, the mechanism has been implemented to ensure survival by restoring individuals to a community as well as fostering cohesion within a community. A person's refusal to conform was met with punishment and social stigmatization. In Judaism and Christianity, shame first appears in the book of Genesis when Adam and Eve's disobedience transformed them from a state of being unashamed in Genesis 2.25 to covering themselves with fig leaf aprons and hiding from God. The biblical view of shame places it as a component of relationship, while an absence of shame often denotes moral failure. Scripture tells us that hearts that agree with God's word avoid shame. While shame is a requisite for true repentance, and those whose relationships with God are restored are delivered from shame. In this we see shame aided in regulating behavior based on God-determined virtues, even in the midst of an outside world whose idolatrous practices stood in stark contrast to scripture. As Yonke Carmen writes regarding prophetic shame language, the exile was an event perceived as acutely humiliating. Objective circumstances, such as the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple, dispossessing of the land, deportation, stripping, raping of the women, and the mocking nations contribute to a sense of humiliation. With this in mind, we see God using honor and shame language even in the text of blessing and cursing found in Deuteronomy 28. Living in agreement with God's community standards of right and wrong results in fullness, abundance, and favor, while those who disregard and choose what's right in their own eyes receive the opposite of honor or blessings. Those who forsake God and his righteous ways receive shame if not attributable to them now, then in the judgment to come. The blessed life is one that is lived in communion with God, which necessitates a biblically-based community standard for interpersonal relationships. In the ancient Roman Greco world, honor and shame were cultural themes that ordered society, according to David De Silva. Honor and shame codes guided social behavior in a culture where personhood was rooted in group values such as patronage and reciprocity or kinship and family. Honor, a highly prestigious title, was determined by the community based on the person's actions as well as their value. Shame or dishonor occurred when the community revoked honor from individuals who behaved shamelessly. Dishonorable conduct revealed a person's disregard for their place and function in the community at large, resulting in public shaming, but it was offered with the positive intent of correction 
and restoration. Michael Gorman says, simply defined, honor and shame refer to the ongoing attribution or loss of esteem by one's peers, family, social class, city, and so on. In Roman society, this respect was based primarily on such things as wealth, education, rhetorical skill, family pedigree, and political connections. These were the culture's status indicators. In this context, self-esteem would be conceived of as a ridiculous oxymoron. The only esteem one has is bestowed not by the self, but by the group. In this environment, peer pressure is not negative or something to avoid, but is viewed as appropriate and welcome. According to Bina Nur, Socrates placed shame as the tension between individuals and society. And in contrast to the Western view of honor and shame, which begins with the individual and extends outward, the Roman Greco view describes how the community feels the emotion that is directed at an individual and reflects it back to the person. A Christian view of honor and shame, however, inverts some aspects of the Greco-Roman concept. During his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them, for then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Fundamentally, Jesus appears to repudiate the public element central to the Greek and perhaps even Jewish conception of honor. In the New Testament texts, biblical and cultural shaming are applied not only to conduct, but to character. Believers are to renounce even secret ways of shame and do nothing that would cause shame. Outside the community of faith, believers are to behave themselves in ways they would not be ashamed, even in a setting of clashing religious and cultural expectations. History and literature affirm the use of public shaming beyond the New Testament era to enforce societal norms through public humiliation. From the Middle Ages to the early 1800s, pillories, a type of wooden stock, were used. Masses of people from the community crowded around the criminal to taunt, insult, and pelt the violator with rotten food. Nathaniel Hawthorne's fictional work, The Scarlet Letter, depicted the communal shaming of a woman who committed adultery by forcing her to wear a red letter A as a badge of shame whenever she appeared in public. Public flogging, cucking stools on which persons were forced to sit in immodest humiliation, and ducking stools attached to long beams lowered and raised the criminals into deep waters to shame and even execute. Less severe practices, such as shaving the heads of French women accused of fraternizing with German soldiers, have been utilized even in the last century. Regarding the shaping power of shame, Tree Mike writes, in some contemporary Asian and African cultures, shaming children in particular is considered an expression of love and moral guidance. As neuroscientists and psychologist Lisa Feldman Barrett posits, it's about connection and repairing and honoring a relationship. The majority of developed nations no longer use corporal punishment, but public shaming can be seen taking on new forms aided by the prolific availability and use of technology. While shame has been successfully used to prompt individuals to positive reformations that lead to moral development and restored relationships between God and others, publicly degrading others often fails to do so and is more destructive rather than constructive. In view of modern shame in an age of humiliation, a term used by Kathy O'Neill in her book, The Shame Machine, believers must consider differing worldviews and systems of values as their contrasting worlds overlap in a global community. When a single set of public standards cannot be found to agree on societal rules and norms, the human collective determines an alternative set of values, attempting to shame others to conform to their view. Social media 
highlights these practices as we see users call out other individuals and groups in ways that judge others as guilty without investigating their intent and without consequences following inappropriate overreach. For a Christian, seeking the good of all people, especially the household of faith, motivates the individual to conform to God's word. Shame has played an important role as a social and moral guide, providing accountability among those with a common set of standards, but the practice only works for the good for those concerned with the community. In our digital age, shaming has become widespread for the same reasons it was used in the past. As Deborah Kai expounds, the purpose of public shaming is to call out and jeer at violators of expected group norms, to force the violators and anyone watching to become aware of and in line with normative expectations and to encourage social rejection, to publicly embarrass or ostracize the violators if they fail to repent and align themselves with the group's expectations. People outside the church may use social media to shame those who exemplify biblical morality in attempts to influence and change rather than effectively interact and engage in constructive dialogue. Christians should not embrace these techniques in attempts to shame others into agreeing with them. Believers have a duty to speak the truth in love and also speak with wisdom. Let's turn now to look at the social consequences of shameful informing, conforming, and reforming. The practice of shaming is fraught with ethical questions, many of which conflict with gaining and maintaining a biblical foundation of self. Virtue signaling, a term coined by James Bartholomew in 2015, is described as expressing opinions that will show others that you are indeed a good or acceptable person. And it can lead individuals into making choices for the sole purpose of demonstrating moral superiority. Jason McKelly considers Judas a prime example of a virtue signaler. His comments regarding the cost of the nard poured out upon Jesus when the money would have been better spent on doing good for the poor earned him the title the patron saint of virtue signaling from James Sale. Rather than protesting someone else's actions as not as moral as mine, William Willimon considers the body of Christ, sent by the Spirit, is God's virtue signal. The church in action, not giving a pretense for public show or for a public relations post. According to God's word, virtue signalers have their own reward, as noted in Matthew 6, 28. Also of concern, social media allows for the framing of self in a milieu of superficial incomplete representations. Trevor Sutton suggests the steady rise of Facebook has deepened the need for theological reflection regarding social media. John Barclay writes, in an age when people fear the judgment of their peers far more than the judgment of God, we have become increasingly petulant, critical, even cruel, and it's proving hard to take. Our contemporaries are not now primarily trying to win the favor of God, they are trying to win the favor of one another. Positing that technology is shaped by humans and technology shapes humans, Trevor Sutton focuses on the human penchant to contend for their righteousness with a one-click like, boasting of their own righteousness while humiliating others. Another aspect to consider raised prior to the digital age by sociologist Charles Horton Cooley, who coined the phrase looking glass self, is considering how one's concept of self is gained by social interaction. In essence, watching how others react to different versions of ourselves that we present on social media informs our self-identity based on what others see and say about us. Cooley maintains the concept of the looking glass self originates with God's word that not only discloses human beings are created in God's image, but were made to reflect that image. 
The caveat, however, is that we find the mirror not in the one-eyed medium monster that reflects a cyber self-image, according to Mary Aiken, but in the mirror of the Word of God. A true self-identity, especially for a believer, must be formed within as the soul aligns with the Word of God, not based on social media interactions. Jesus said, How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God, connecting a true perception with false perception of Christ's view of honor and shame? Peter and John also demonstrate the inverted kingdom principle when they left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name of Jesus. In concert with the above, a concern for the effects of social media on traditional communities, according to Suriel Rashi and Hananel Rosenberg, is that the cultural threat and that it conspicuously reinforces secular values and encourages a permissive atmosphere. Rashi and Rosenberg suggest these features lead to the promotion of extreme individualism and the disintegration of communal and religious affiliations. And Mike expresses concern that the anonymity of social media by means of public shaming takes people to task, continually churning out new offenses, new targets, new names, with the intent in great measure to cancel traditional biblical norms through social reckoning that threatens cultural underpinnings and the collective future of the global community at large, particularly conservative Christian communities. This leads to another aspect, the social construct of forced reformation through digitally mediated vigilantism. According to Deborah Kai, when large numbers of people interact, coherence is built around broader negativisms. Clicktivism, the practice of supporting causes via social media and other online methods, includes shaming to propagate ideologies. While building public awareness on alleged scams and unethical behavior seems to serve a public good, utilizing bullish online shaming tactics to exact revenge or settle personal vendettas and perceived wrongs or to challenge societal norms can snowball from one incendiary post into a herd that stampedes on a person or a concept to build negative consensus and drive the view of the person into obsoletism. Shaming may offer a needed channel in some cases and serve a redintegrative function to bring individuals in alignment with the accepted societal norms, but concern for a lack of context and consequential ideological advancement raise flags, especially from a Christian perspective. The ethical self may be difficult to maintain while undertaking such behaviors, and care must be taken to respond with words and actions reflective of the very words and behaviors of Christ whom we are called to emulate. Turning now to social media warriors and the spiritual consequences of a call-out culture, we first consider that even when done with a positive intention, unintended negative consequences may result from those who engage in media wars. As Jesus admonished Peter to put away his sword, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword, believers should use caution when they raise the weapon of social media warfare. When Christians engage in public shaming, the tables often turn, and what was meant to be a light is not only ineffective, but brings reproach to the kingdom of God. Biblical concepts must always be expressed with godly character, Even when offered with kindness, shaming tactics adopted by Christians can open a door for insulting, mean-spirited rebukes and even bullying that leads to oppressing voices in the public square in a society grounded on the principle of freedom of speech. 
Rather than engaging in quarrelsome conversations, the Apostle Paul advised Timothy to avoid such behavior and gently lead those who would be instructed in truth. Christians should seek to live above reproach, to emulate, leading by example. Leaders should also avoid contributing to the defamation of the church's reputation. In the midst of a call-out culture, Christians should be aware of how their words affect others. Jesus, as Sharon Hod Miller expresses in her book Nice, understood the difference between graciousness and personal compromise, between speaking truth and needlessly alienating people. According to Miller, concern for looking good over being good arises when ethical behavior is a mask worn rather than the true face of deeply rooted character. Using social media in ways that purposely alienate people does not harmonize with the biblical principles of a God who represented himself in the parabolic form of a shepherd who would leave 90 and 9 to rescue one. As Miller describes, we exist in a world that swings between sweetness and outrage, two behaviors that seem to be at odds with one another. In reality, they are two sides of the same coin of lack of spiritual formation. Developing spiritual maturity helps believers recognize bad fruit from good fruit that springs from a soul rooted and abiding in Christ. Trust levels, however, have fallen woefully low, and as Cat Rosenfield writes, without trust we become fearful and desperate to exert control. We are less charitable, more judgmental, and more likely to go to extremes. This leads to the cancel culture phenomena that feeds on victimization, polarization, and elimination of cultural dinosaurs in the name of progress, a realm a believer must exercise wisdom in engaging so as not to bring a reproach on the kingdom of God. As representatives of Christ's body, individuals must use careful language that could not easily be misconstrued as hate or harassment, nor should we be easily offended or engage in cyber lynching, especially in quick-draw responses to incendiary, divisive, and unvetted statements. In a call-out culture, the church is the called out, part of a chosen people, a royal priesthood, set apart to declare the praises of God who brought us out of darkness into his wonderful light. The world will know we are Christians by our love, exhibited not only in our faithful walks with God, but in the way we show love one to another, rather than biting the devouring. In context of filling the Great Commission, shaming is not an evangelistic tool. When originating within the Christian community and reaching beyond, believers must be careful to speak in ways that welcome rather than exclude or alienate the very lives they were meant to reach with the good news of the kingdom. We must keep the goal of discipleship ever at the fore as we seek to nurture the church and evangelize the world. Building unity in community requires wisdom, sensitivity, and spiritual maturity that exemplifies a trustworthy witness over time. When believers act with indignation, riding the digital pulses on moral high horses, that type of call-out Christianity does little to spread the gospel. In fighting among believers and judgmentalism, fail to demonstrate the love of God among God's people and to the community at large. Paul admonished believers to make spiritual judgments in all things, but he instructed God's people not to judge those outside the church. Jesus taught his followers to judge not on appearances, but rather judge correctly. Shaming, even in the name of spreading the gospel, fails to release those in need and instead weaponizes God's truth in a non-redemptive manner. In conclusion, 
The issue of social media shaming is complex, especially when the target is the culture as a whole, as opposed to its historical purpose of correcting and reinforcing society's ethics and values Public shaming has evolved into an act of punishment, coercion, and a change agent. This is concerning for the believer whose morality, founded in Judeo-Christian ethics, are placed in the crosshairs of those who would disregard or amend God's word to agree with their determination of what is good, right, and just. As we have seen in both the Old Testament and the New Ultimately, the referent, God, determines blessing and cursing, honor and shame, based on divine right of sovereignty. For the Christian, in context of shaming and social media, we are called to bless and unite, not shame and divide. Biblical standards for virtuous living, even when disagreed upon in differing Christian circles, do not support public shaming. As we have discussed shame and social media in a framework of biblical ethics, we've demonstrated that social media shaming undermines traditional Christian ethical values as evidenced by the historical attempts of societies to psychologically impact human behaviors through shame. The dysfunctionality of maintaining ethical selfhood in a realm of shallow social representations and the inadvertent use of shame by Christians as a legitimate tool to influence personal ethical growth in others without consideration for their distinct personhood.